It's the Hero Show. <laughs> Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. Starring the invulnerable John Hersey and the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably John Hersey. How you doing this morning, John? I'm excellent. It's uh, it's a beautiful sunny day. It's a little chilly. Uh, I found out this morning, my birthday's in a few days, I found out this morning that uh, my wife had a surprise trip for us planned, and uh, we are going to go to the... the the uh, you know the the stomping grounds of one of my greatest all time greatest heroes Benjamin Franklin who we did on this show in episode two. Wow, that's good. Well, first of all, happy birthday, and second of all, you know, hope you have a great trip. You going to Philadelphia? Um, yes, <laughs> going to Philly. Remember W. C. Fields. So what was it? He wanted, what did he want on his tombstone? So, something uh, all things considered, I'd rather be in Philadelphia. <laughs> 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 it, might That's even, funny. it might even be on this tombstone. Um, anyhow, um, we are going to finish up with our discussion of the great steel master, Andrew Carnegie. And um, where, we, where, we, where we left off, we saw that he sold Carnegie Steel to a consortium headed by J.P. Morgan for, uh, for something like $300 million, which was worth, I, I, I think it was worth like $6 billion in today's in today's money, or something, you know, or, or, or something like that, and that made him briefly the the wealthiest man in the world before being surpassed by another one of the heroes we've discussed, namely the great John D. Rockefeller. So, John, you want to take it from there? Where are we gonna? We, we, uh, some some of the things we need to discuss. I think we we have to discuss the Homestead strike, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and Carnegie's role or lack thereof in that, and then yeah. he, then his philanthropy, which was uh, extraordinary. And his his famous essay, "The Gospel of Wealth." We still have a lot of lot of ground uh, to cover. So yeah, we got through the uh, we got through the sale to um, for for J P Morgan and then set up uh, United States Steel. But there are a few things I think we should we should go back to, including the Homestead Strike, which I think was in eighteen ninety two, if I recall correctly. Yes. That's correct. By the way, um, we, w- at one point we're going to do a hero show episode on the great J.P. Morgan, who was also an extraordinary, you know, a capitalist, uh, you know, of the of the so-called Gilded Age, but what I, I renamed in the Capitalist Manifesto the the Inventive Period. Uh, so we will we'll, happily so. Yeah, thank you. We'll do Morgan at some point in the future. Homestead strike is. Um, Perhaps the main reason why Carnegie is vilified by leftist intellectuals and historians. I mean, even if there was no Homestead strike, he'd be vilified just for just for being mm. a you know a, a millionaire, a, a gazillion, right. a, gazi- a gazillionaire. But the Homestead strike was a, was a bloody uh, strike. And before we get to a little background here, Carnegie prior to the Homestead strike, like you, you're right, John, it was 1892. Um, Carnegie had avoided labor strife by, you know, what, by refusing to hire so-called strike breakers, and and we need to be you know, be clear on this because the union the unions are self righteously indignant about any company bringing in independent workers when their members go on strike. You know, the the unions have the have the job have the idea, or at least at least. Most of them, especially the the ones who have clamored for for government coercion to, to you know to close the shop so that so that the the uh, owners can negotiate only with union members and not with independent workers. Um, so the unions have the idea that that the jobs belong to us, even if we decide we're not going to work the jobs. They're our jobs, <laughs> and so when. Um, Companies have, have have hired independent workers during a during a strike. Uh, the unions have often unleashed just heinous violence against you know against the so called strike breakers, against anyone willing to to cross uh, a, a picket line. You know, and um, it's really it's it's just it's 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 ugly, and it's morally wrong. I mean, I want I want to be very clear that. Um, Owners have have the moral right to hire anybody they want to work on their plant. It's their property. It's their company. Uh, they want to hire non-union workers. It's their right to do so. 
that they want to hire non-union workers when the union's on strike. It's their right to do so. The jobs don't belong to the to the unions. I mean, the union membership. That's that's a moral abomination, and that has led. You know, if you, I'm no expert, John, on the history of of U.S. labor strife, but I know a little bit about it. I know the kind of lethal violence. I mean, where they murder strike breakers, so-called strike breakers, who are really they're, they're to be objective about it. They're independent workers. They're non-union workers hired by the company. But the strike break is scabs, you know, terms. And they've murdered them. And there's, there's been, historically, there's been tremendous violence. And by the way, it's interesting. When the companies operate a struck plant with, with executives, with company executives, there's usually no violence against them. The, the very little violence, there's been some, but very little violence directed against you know, against company executives. It's, it's when they hire non-union workers, independent workers, that's when the, the violence is unleashed and it's often been lethal violence. It's just hideous. And, you know, you know the great Milton Friedman, Nobel laureate in, in uh, economics, has, point, has pointed out that the government will very often look the other way uh, against murderous violence that's unleashed during strikes, which they, they, the governments will often tolerate that, which they won't tolerate under other, nor should they, uh, under other circumstances. So the unions often have literally gotten away with murder. Now, Carnegie knew yeah, they, that, I'm sorry, go ahead, John. I was just going to add here that obviously they, they shouldn't look the other way in any circumstance, and, and especially not in such an immoral circumstance in, in which the strikers are claiming a right to jobs and... Uh, Carnegie successfully headed off many strikes. Um, he had, he had, you know, he, he ran companies for decades. So is, and given the period that he's running companies in, it's sort of a given that he's going to run into problems with labor relations at some point. And he did multiple times, but he was always very successful in, um, in pacifying those that worked for him and appealing to their reason and getting them to, to adopt measures that made more sense. You know, um, in uh, a case that, that came up after the Homestead strike, <clears throat> one of the things that, that lasted for decades after, I think even up until Carnegie's death, was he instituted, I think, one of the first sliding pay scale mm-hmm. systems. Right. And so this worked that pay was not, it was not just based on, okay, well, the, the labor union demands this, Therefore, they get this per hour for these jobs. It was, um, well, when the company does really, really well, you get more and you'll never get less than this certain minimum amount. But your pay can slide between uh, that minimum and much higher, depending on how well the company is doing. And, you know, he pointed to this that this turns everybody into a, a, a cooperative effort because it's uh, it's in everyone's interests for the company to do well. And when the company does well, everybody profits. And when the company doesn't do well, instead of people losing their jobs, most people are, are more interested in having job security than they are always having the same exact, uh, you know, take home pay every week. And so the uh, the workers readily agree to this. And interesting in this scenario, when, when this happened, uh, there was a threat of a strike. Uh, in fact, there was a strike that lasted for a couple of weeks. And the uh and carnegie said you know when when you guys decide to come back to work you'll come back to work on my terms i'm not going to replace you in the meantime but the factory will stand unused until you all come back and when they decided to come back to the table the uh the the union uh union leads they they said well just do us this favor uh allow the uh, head of the unions to sign on behalf of the workers. And Carnegie said, yes, sure, that's reasonable, but just do me this favor in return. Also let the workers read and sign the agreement on their own. And one whispered to the other, well, the game is up because they realized, well, the workers don't need us to negotiate a certain pay scale for them. They don't need us at all. There's no sense in paying their dues. And so this... (laughs) You know, right. Carnegie was very sly with this, and and they really had no means of backing out at that point. He'd given them uh, their uh, the, the favor that they asked, and so they gave him the favor that he asked in return. But the union pretty quickly disbanded because there was nothing that the union leaders could get that the 
uh, workers can get for themselves. Carnegie was a canny Scot, as as they say, and and you're right. It's uh, to put it in different terms. He <coughs> he introduced. Uh, a way there was no wage ceiling, but there was a wage floor, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that's a good that's a good deal because during business slumps, which happen in recessions and stuff, you know, uh, the like you said, the workers wouldn't lose their jobs. The wages would just go down until the until the company started to prosper again, and, and then the wages could go up. There's no ceiling. There's no no ceiling on how high the wages could go. And um, Carnegie had avoided strikes prior to 1892 Homestead. I mean, he had avoided labor violence prior to the 1892 Homestead strike because he refused to operate struck plants. You know, and uh, he he uh, he just waited the union out. He he's, he he didn't bring in independent workers. I don't think he even operated it with you know with with executives. He didn't operate at all. He, he and uh, his reasoning was the men have to eat, so at some point they'll have to work. And he just waited, he waited the unions out and avoided violence that way. And he also thought, Carnegie also thought and said publicly, and this reminds me of uh, Hank Reardon in, uh, in, that, in Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, he said, I have the best labor force available. I was, I'm not going to replace these guys. I can't get, I can't get steel workers better than, than the guys that are, or, you know, even as good as the guys I already have. So I'll just wait, wait out the, the strike until the, until the guys are ready to, they need to make money. They need to, you know, feed their families until they're ready to, to go back to work. So, you know, Carnegie was, uh, was a very, very, uh, smart businessman. And, uh, and he was, and he was so charming, you know, everybody thought, you know, he was just, he was just, you know, had this, a sunny disposition is, is worth more than a fortune, right? Isn't that something like that? that? was a famous quote from Khan. He had it. And, you know, a lot of people, he's a great rock and tour. And, you know, a lot, a lot of people just loved him, you know, at a, at a personal personal level. And um, so Homestead, Homestead is an anomaly. So this is in the summer of 1892. Carnegie in Scotland, you know, for, to avoid the, the heat and humidity of the Northeast of the United States during the summer. And, and just to, to harken back to where that started from was when he was felled by heat prostration and, and overwork in his 20s when he was, um, uh, he was a, a, sta- a staunch abolitionist and he was uh, uh, operating, he was, he was making sure the telegraph lines were in, in Virginia were in, in service for the, for the Union Army, right? And he was... Uh, He's building the, the, the you know when when telegraph lines are knocked out, poles are knocked down during, during the war. He's having them you know rebuilt. He collapsed, and after that, he was very very susceptible to to heat and humidity. I can I can uh, relate to that. I never suffered from heat prostration, but I hate the hot humid weather. I just hate it. I'd love to go to Scotland every summer. Uh, and so when, when Carnegie um, had a fortune, you know he would he would do that. And he, but let's also we, we need to point out even before we get to Frick. And the, and the Homestead strike, Carnegie was a genius at delegating responsibility. He was an absolute genius in personnel. Nobody was better than Carnegie than recruiting talent, recognizing talent, finding the right place for this guy at the right time, you know, cultivating talent and promotion from within the ranks. And Carnegie was an absolute genius. Uh, there's people like Henry Clay Frick and Charles Schwab and, you know, and there's a, there's a bunch of others. So Frick was running the Carnegie Steel, and Frick was a tough guy, man. I, I mean, <laughs> Frick was a was a hard rock. And by the way, the the Frick Museum in New York City, which is you know my favorite art museum, is is it, it, it's not anybody who's a, if you're an art lover in in New York, you got to make it to the Frick. To me, John, the Met is just unmanageable. It's just like it's like it's just over. It's over. It's overwhelming. Although I like the American, you know, wing, and that, that's where uh, Lloyd's is, uh, you know, Washington Cross in the Delaware is. But the Frick is small, and it's got a bunch of masterpieces, and you could do it in one day. And uh, you know, and Frick was a connoisseur of, you know, of great art. But um, he was a, he was a hard rock, John. I mean, he was a tough nut. There was there's that part of Frick's biography where he was assaulted by some you know, some communist or an- anarchist and shot him and stabbed him and, you know, and, uh, you know, Frick was seriously wounded. And in less than a week, or in, in most a week, he was back to work. You know, he survived. He was back to work. You know, he was a tough guy. I think, didn't Frick come up out of the coal mines, you know, in the, in Pennsylvania, I think? I, I'm not sure. 
not sure. He was, I don't know Frick's biography, but it wouldn't surprise me. Like you said, uh, uh, Carnegie was just excellent at spotting talent. You know what some people today call flame spotting. Um, he he could and you know Rand talks about Ayn Rand talks about in her essay Capitalism the un, un, Unknown Ideal in the 19th century political economy as a social science started to blossom and come into its own and political economists attempted to uh, attempted to do economics attempted to understand economics without understanding man the the key uh, the, the, really the, the central focus of any humanities should be of course man <clears throat> but Carnegie writing in this time as uh, political economy starts to become a science understands fully that man is is the central resource and he writes in his as we'll get to his gospel of wealth that uh, it's it's the man of talent that is the generator of wealth and and uh, and so you've got to you have to find those really really bright people and make them your partners you know go out and 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 it you know today's entrepreneurs you know there's a, a guy called uh, Dan Sullivan who's you know, excellent, excellent uh, thinker and, and helper of other entrepreneurs. He's got a, a recent book co-written with Benjamin Hardy called Who Not How. And it's this philosophy of delegation. It's with every project, you should be thinking, who can help me do this or who can do this for me, not how can I do this? And I really think that Carnegie mastered this skill. And if we want a, a retrospective case study of who, not how, we can definitely look to Carnegie for that. Absolutely. As a, by the way, I just want to say as, as an aside, I have a long time, very close objectivist friend. He's really, he's, he's really my, my brother, you know, one of my friend named Dan Sullivan. And he, and he loves the hero show. Johnny tells me that all the time. He, he, he listens to the hero show while he's working out. So one day, Dan, Dan you're going to be working out and you're going to hear the great John Hersey mention Dan Sullivan. So, you know, this is, this is, is it the same Dan Sullivan? <laughs> no, no, no. This, okay. Yeah, no, my brother, Dan Sullivan, is, was an expert dentist for many years in, in St. Louis. Um, okay. But, <laughs> no, but anyhow, uh, so what Frick Frick was operating the you know the the, the was he I think he was president of Carnegie Steel at that time um, mm. but, and, uh, and like I said he was a, he was a he was a tough guy he thought Carnegie was too soft you know on the, on union guys and strikers and strikers see I have a copy of the Capitalist Manifesto just by accident so I just happen to have this copy here here with me and let me read something you know from the the, the appendix here on Robert Barron's or Productive Geniuses. Henry Clay Frick, a superbly able man, but of a more pugnacious school of thought in dealing with labor unrest, was chairman of the Carnegie Steel Company in 1892. Frick believed that Carnegie's method of dealing with labor disputes was soft. Before leaving the country for cooler climes, as he did every summer, Carnegie recommended that Frick shut the homestead plant down in case of a strike. That's Carnegie's you know, normal method of operation, dealing with a strike. This Frick did not do. He fortified the plant grounds as a prelude to hiring workers as individuals, not as union members. Thousands of workers, union and non-union men alike, then rose up and seized control of Carnegie's mills. Instead of appealing to the governor of Pennsylvania for troops to regain control of the company's property, Frick made the mistake of introducing 300 hated by union members, Pinkerton guards, into the tent situation. When the Pinkertons attempted to disembark from the barges carrying them and land on company ground, one of the strikers fired a shot. Actually, that's in dispute. Nobody knows who fired the first shot. Uh, when I, when I revised Catman, I got to change that. So, somebody fired a shot. Uh, the Pinkertons blasted back with full force. The strike became a large-scale riot, and men on both sides were killed. When the governor finally did send 8,000 soldiers, the, the strikers relinquished company property without a hand raised in hostility. In the end, months later, the company won its demands and broke the union. But the haunting specter of lethal violence hung over a leading center of, a, of American productivity. So, I mean, there's, there's uh, you know, a, a brief recounting of what happened 
uh, at, at Homestead, and 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 leftist historians and intellectuals have, you know, excoriated Carnegie, for, you know, for this ever, from that day to this. Now, Carnegie certainly is responsible for the actions of Frick, who is his, is his man. But uh, the to me, John, I mean, you know, when I'm, I, I know I know people, you know, might disagree with this, uh, but but to, to me. The, the key point in the Homestead strike was the labor union, the, the workers seizing control of Carnegie's property. That's the, they're the ones who, whoever fired the first shot, nobody knows. Uh, my anti-union prejudices <laughs> must have been the union guys. But, but they're the ones, and they very well may have been, they're the ones who initiated the, the, the use of force. They're the ones who seized Carnegie's property, that's, which is illegal and immoral and wrong. Uh, and then they're the ones who, the union is the one who set the context, or the workers, and some, some of them were non-union workers. The workers were the ones who set the context of violence, right? And, and Frick was perfectly within his rights to bring in Pinkin and guards to try and, you know, win back uh, com- company property. My understanding of this is he made a tactical error, not a, not an ethical error. That is, he should have gone to the governor in the first place. And he sent in 8,000 troops with an overwhelming, overwhelming use of force. The, the union guys just, they didn't resist. They just left, they left the property. That's what Frick should have done. Um, but that's not an ethical error. That, that's, that's, that's a tactical error. And the, 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 the moral blame here rests primarily on the, on the union for seizing Carnegie's property. Yeah. I think Carnegie's interpretation of it was, well, Frick should never have brought in these Pinkerton, these Pinkertons. I don't know much about. Maybe you can shed some more light on who these Pinkertons were. Uh, interesting name, but uh, you know, Carnegie said that if he were if he were there, he wouldn't have tried to operate the plant without the the workers. He would have just shuttered the plant yeah, and waited until they were ready to to talk. That's what he that's what he always did. Pinkerton mm-hmm. Detective Agency was a was a famous and prominent detective agency. You know, at at, at, at this time. And if I remember correctly, you know, we, we, we did a, you know, we, we did a show on, on the, on the immortal Sherlock Holmes. I mm-hmm. believe in one of the Sherlock Holmes stories, I can't remember which, which one off the top of my head, but Arthur Conan Doyle has Sherlock Holmes interacting with some Pinkerton detectives, I think from New York, who were, you know, who were pursuing some bad guy in, you know, in, in, in Britain, but they were a famous detective agency and, you know, and they were tough guys and, very often, companies use Pinkertons as strike breakers, as the unions called them, to, you know, to see, you know, to seize back property uh, that that had been had been had stolen by you know that way that, that the unions had, had occupied the company company property and stuff like that. So so yeah, the unions generally hated the Pinkertons because the companies often used them to, to bust up to bust up strikes. Um, so yeah, I can understand where Carnegie's coming from. He would have just shut the the plant down in the in the, in the first place. Uh, um, but yeah, the, the the key point of the violence is the yeah. You, I don't want to sound like a little kid. You started it, but you, you, you know, <laughs> the, the unions did start it. They did initiate for. There's no question. Nobody nobody disputes that. That was the first act of 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 wrongdoing. And like I said, if if I were Frick. I would have gone to the governor immediately for, for the state militia. You bring in 8,000 troops, it stands to reason the, the union guys would surrender, uh, and they did. But it was all after, after the, the violent altercation had already taken place. So it's unfortunate, uh, tragic that this people got killed. But the moral blame, I think, rests 100% on the, on the union and the people, who, the people who initiated the force, not on Frick. Well, Carnegie. Absolutely. So that was, that was uh, you know a, um, a real uh, that's that that's a you know a, a tragic I- instance of, of labor violence, uh, <clears throat> but the unions have done terrible things you know historically to independent workers and you know that that like 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 I said before that the that the companies will hire during uh, during strikes so this is just one more example of you know of, of union violence, but. We can we can move on to to other issues here. Sunnier climbs. Sunnier climbs, you know, and uh, Carnegie's philanthropy. Now, now, now we're in the uh, early twentieth century. 
Carnegie's in his 60s and 70s. He's uh, retired from steel. He sold the company to to uh, the consortium headed by J.P. Morgan, which, like you said, became U.S. Uh, Morgan organized into U.S. Steel, you know, an, an enormously productive steel company. And Carnegie devoted much of the rest of his life to an, an extensive, an even enormous amount of philanthropy, didn't he? Yeah, he gave away almost all of his wealth before dying. Um, in 1889, a few years before he, uh, what, three years before he sold the company. <clears throat> he published the Gospel of Wealth, or what became known as the Gospel of Wealth. It was originally just published as Wealth in the National Review, I believe. Um, it might not have been the National Review. I'm, I'm having well, trouble. Well, the National Review was a, a conservative publication founded by William Buckley in the 1950s. I don't. I don't remember the the. I don't know. North might, American Review, uh, maybe. Yeah. Sorry, well, I, I, mean, well, I don't there, even call the. Well, there might have been a National Review back then. I don't. I don't. I don't know. But yeah, but you're right. The original title in its American publication was just Wealth. It was when it was published in Britain that it became it acquired its famous name of the Gospel of Wealth. I think. I, I think. But anyway, yeah. um, so you you were talking about the essay. Yeah, I think you know this is. Uh, we cannot discuss Carnegie both his, his uh, virtues and his vices without discussing the gospel of wealth, because I think both are on display in this essay. I agree. Uh, so the gospel of wealth, I mean, he, he begins by making his attempt at a refutation, I think, of this communitarian socialist ideal of uh, expropriating wealth and redistributing it to people who, who need it. And he brings this in explicitly. He talks about communism and socialism and how uh, they don't work and how this uh, ideal of individualism, the idea that each person should, I love how he uses, uses actually Washington's, George Washington's favorite quote from the Bible that each man will sit under his own fig tree and, and none shall scare him, <laughs> none shall make him afraid. <laughs> Uh, you know, he, he talks about how private property enabled civilization to grow, and he compares what America is today to the Sioux tribes that were then existing. And he says, well, you know, there, yes, it's true. There was great equality. The, the tent of the, uh, the chieftain was little different of the tent of the, the lowest man there in the tribe. But you know, with that equality is in incredible poverty. And we are far better off if uh, there is great inequality, but some people have massive uh, economic power, the ability to, to uh, bring together in their homes cl great collections of art, of literature, of philosophy, the ideas of, of the ages. And so we're, we're far better with this. But he goes on to, um, you know, as we'll get into, he, he goes on to say that, okay, well, yes, we need the system of private property in which people can accumulate vast amounts of wealth. But then once people have accumulated vast amounts of wealth, what is the best means of, of using that wealth? And specifically when millionaires and billionaires die, what should happen with their estates? And he says, well, there are three things that can happen. Um, they can hold on to every last penny as long as they can and, and basically uh, you know, take it to the grave with them in hopes that they can take it beyond the grave. Uh, they can leave it to their, you know, their loved ones. Or they can try to distribute it during their lifetimes, try to use it to promote the happiness of the community. And he goes full force for this last idea. He says that the other two are bad, that uh, you know, it's, it's a moral mark against a man if he dies with his money. And it does his, uh, it does his own family no good if he leaves them the money, especially young men, because, well, what are they going to do? Drink and, and gamble, and they're not going to have any need to be productive, so they won't. So it's actually a curse, not this huge boon that many people think it is. And so really what people ought to do is give their, their wealth away. But I think what is most striking if you read the gospel of wealth is this moral argument that he makes that 
it's really immoral for you to uh, do what you want with your own money or have your money disposed of as you'd please after you pass on that in essence, he, he comes around to the same idea that was very popular at the time of this tribalism of, well, you know, there's this social product that you've been, you know, key and absolutely essential, vital even in creating, but now you owe that you owe it to the community to, to give it back somehow. And, you know, we hear this idea all the time. It's unsurprising. And uh, it's unsurprising to hear it even from a great capitalist, because this is the, the ethics of altruism that we're so familiar with. The idea that uh, man doesn't exist for his own sake, but for the sake of what he can do for others. That is, his own life is not the moral purpose. His own happiness is not the moral purpose of his life. Right. You're right. I mean, Carnegie's a very mixed bag on, on, on this. Uh, but before, before we get in, de- in deep here to, to discuss the moral philosophy, when you were talking about Carnegie's criticism of, of socialism, I was reminded of the great Margaret Thatcher, you know, who we need to do. She's a real heroine. We need to do a, a, an episode on Margaret Thatcher. I think you could probably, you might, might be able to find it on, you know, on YouTube, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure about about that. But there's that that famous passage where she was, uh, she was speaking to Parliament, right? And she she said something like, you know, Labor wants us all together down here, you know. Whereas I I want us like you know like this, you know, where, where some of us you know rise above this you know you know, you know this common you know this con- this con- this floor. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean Margaret Thatcher was was defending the inequalities of wealth on the on, on the capitalism that the, but oh yeah you know well, labor labor wanted us here and I think Margaret Thatcher said I want I want us like this you know where the floor rises and some people go go way above that which is what capitalism does relative to socialism and I think Carnegie um, understood that but yeah this this uh, this <laughs> just want to be clear on this there's this altruist, strong altruist element, though this, I should say, this horrific altruist element in, in Carnegie's Gospel of Wealth. And you, you know, you articulated that nicely. Um, but it's a mixed, it's a mixed bag. There's some good things here too. Um, Carnegie may, may well be right in many cases that when people inherit wealth and haven't worked for it, they, they tend to squander it. There's a lot of, a lot of cases uh, like that, and I and I think you know, extrapolating from Carnegie here, that the wealthier a family is, the more they should they should have their kids working at a very early age, you know, working working for money to to learn, you know, the value of a, of a of a work ethic, and not just you know have everything given given to them, fancy schools and you know cars and boats and jets and you know and, and stuff but but work because there's there's too often the case your Carnegie's right in many cases not every case um but in in many cases it, it's true about you know the heirs of a wealthy fortune become you know playboys or you know playgirls like Paris Hilton was infamous you know for that you know 15 or, or, or 20 years I haven't heard much from her recently <laughs> she, she, no who <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For, uh, she was heiress of the Hilton fortune. She, you know, and she's she, disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so so there's some truth truth to that. But at the same time, uh, you know, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I got the impression that 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 Carnegie also experienced this as a joyful process. That that it was very personally rewarding to him, selfishly, uh, and and. The, the, his own philanthropy went to, to many many worthy causes, you know, uh, which we, we should get to in just a minute. But uh, I want to get back to you know criticize it because you're right. There's an altruist collectivist element here. Uh, we want to be very clear. No, no, Mr. Carnegie, we have enormous respect for your productivity, but somebody who works for their money has the right to spend it any way they want. Uh, you, on their kids or on themselves, or if they want to give it away, it's their money they've worked for it. And 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 you hit the the important point. You know, the, the, my own happiness is the is anybody's own happiness is the proper uh, is the proper goal and proper purpose of their life. We have to be very clear on that. Uh, so it's a choice. 
that some that somebody has as to, you know as to as to what they, they they do with their money. It should be a matter of personal values, Mr. Carnegie, not a matter of duty. There's no Kantian and unchosen obligation to give that money away to benefit the society. Uh, another point I wanted to make here, John, is even on its own terms, if we if, if you know the uh, benefiting society, benefiting human beings. Uh, is philanthropy the best way to do it? How about if we reinvest that money in Carnegie Steel? How about if we re if we invest that money in Rockefeller's Standard Oil? How about if we invest that money in some you know Apple or some or Honda or some enormously productive company? Because you know, Carnegie is a perfect example of it. The mass production of steel brings down the the price of steel enormously from what it was, you know, previous, earlier than, than Carnegie. And that benefits everybody in this huge way. You, you know, the, the steel girders are much less expensive and you can build skyscrapers. You can build, you know, Roblin's uh, uh, suspension bridges and you, you know, you automobiles, you know, Henry Ford can mass produce automobiles inexpensively. And, you know, farm equipment that enables American farmers to grow enormous amounts of food can now be produced inexpensively. If I really, if, if my goal was really to benefit mankind, I think I would have put my money in Carnegie Steel, <laughs> you know, or in, in Standard Oil. So, uh, yeah, there's this tension within his own thinking that you see very clearly if you read his autobiography and then you read it is uh, the Gospel of Wealth. <clears throat> he talks at one point about the um, the <clears throat> um, sorry, I just we just had somebody else try to join our call. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yeah. I don't know why. Well, no, well, the, but, well uh, you know, the babes love us, man. They want to. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's, so, it's hard to be rock stars and sex symbols, you know, it's not that easy. Right, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but so Carnegie says at one point that, you know, this idea that you, should, you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket is false, or at least that's not his philosophy. He thinks that absolutely you should. You should put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket closely. And he's, he says that, you know, people commonly uh, attempt to put their – their money in this or that enterprise to spread it out to to you know balance their portfolio and to to ensure that they uh, you know don't fall on hard times uh, and also thinking that they're going to make a bigger profit that way and he says that actually in fact the biggest profit that you can make is usually right there right in front of you but by investing in your own company you know all these companies are operating with old shoddy machines um, if they would just look at, at the books, look at, at what they've got, they would find great ways to put their money to tremendous use and th this would generate enormous wealth. And he, and he clearly sees that uh, industry, that business, this is the way to lift people out of poverty. Um, so, and, and on top of that, he was a devotee of Herbert Spencer, who and a per, really, and I a think- And a personal friend of Spencer. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and Spencer, in my opinion, really misunderstood Darwinism and, and adapted it to what we now know as social Dar Darwinism, mm -hmm. the, the survival of the fittest. And so, again, he's conflicted because Spencer's philosophy is, well, you shouldn't, you know, the, the, the fittest shouldn't uh, finance or, or help out of the whole those uh, who are weaker because this is, this is impeding social progress. So he's conflicted here. And I think, you know, he has the right idea. I mean, um, if you have a tremendous amount of money and it does you great, it, it does you, uh, it, it brings you great joy to uh, put that money where you think it's going to be useful for other people, then do it. And I think one of the best examples of this, <laughs> one we definitely have to talk to talk about on the on the Hero Show is his Hero Fund, the yeah, Carnegie yeah. Hero Fund. Yeah, we should get some of that, by the way. <laughs> He's always, always got got my my hand up, but yeah, the hero fund is yeah definitely get to that in 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 just a in just a minute. But um, you know, it reminded me when we did the 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 episode on John D. Rockefeller, 
Uh, Rockefeller is the most hated of the so-called Robert Barons, even more so than, than Carnegie. And, you know, the, the leftist intellectuals and historians, they may admire Rockefeller's enormous philanthropy, but they hate his business activities. And Rockefeller confounded them. I, they, they still to this day don't understand what his meaning. He said, I don't remember his exact words. I, I remember we, we discussed it on, you know, during the Rockefeller episode. But he said words to the effect that I did more good at Standard Oil than I ever did in all my philanthropy. And he's right. You know, you know what, what that, and his philanthropy did a lot of good. But at Standard Oil, he mass-produced petroleum products. And like Carnegie did with steel, he brought the price down of kerosene and gasoline and all, and, all, you know, and, and heating oil and all these different, different products that enormously benefited, enriched and benefited the lives of millions and millions uh, of people. Ayn Rand, you know, you know, as an example of Ayn Rand's point, that productivity is a major moral virtue. We do not live in a Garden of Eden where all of our wants are satisfied by a benign deity. We need to produce the goods that, that benefit human life. And Rockefeller and Carnegie both were enormous exemplars of, uh, of this. And so I hope, I hope Carnegie realized, uh, you know, at, at least at some implicit level, some visceral gut level maybe, you know, that his, his, his enormous productiveness in steel was a great virtue. Uh, and, that, and, and that, you know, Human, if human life is the standard of value, as Ayn Rand, I think, correctly says it is, Rock, uh, uh, Carnegie's immense productivity in the steel industry was immensely beneficial to human life even before uh, he engaged in, in, the, in the philanthropy. And again, I would, I would say if the goal is to benefit human life, I would, I would put the money into these productive companies because their productivity is, is what benefits uh, human life uh, even more than, well, a lot of the philanthropy Carnegie did was enormously beneficial, right? Libraries, universities, things like that. We need to we need to discuss that because, you know, Carnegie, I would tell him, Mr. Carnegie, as they may say in my native Brooklyn, you've done good, you know? <laughs> you've done good with the philanthropy and you've certainly done good with your productivity at, at Carnegie Steel. But, um, so where do you want to start? The Hero Fund, Carnegie Mellon University, 3,000 libraries. I mean, you know, Carnegie done, he, yeah, he done good with his, he, he chose a lot of um, worthwhile uh, activities and organizations to, to fund with his philanthropy. He didn't just, he didn't squander a, a lot of that $5 billion in today's terms, you know, of, of wealth. What, 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 you want to start with the Hero Fund, John? Well, you yeah, I think that's appropriate. So the Hero Fund being the one that, um, in, in terms of an ongoing program, it was the one, the the first one at least that he came up with uh, of his own accord. Uh, others had, for instance, the New York Public Library System. Um, he, he was approached by someone else with the idea and asked, "Do you want to do you want to help fund this?" And he said, "Absolutely." Uh, but the Hero Fund was really his own idea. He had read about, um, <clears throat> if I if I recall correctly. He read about um, a retired uh, coal superintendent, coal mine superintendent, who um, he he heard about a coal fire, a mine fire, and uh, or a collapse rather, and went to go try to help the men out, and ended up dying himself. I mean, this is beyond the, the the call of duty of course this man is retired he's at home he hears about this collapse and he thinks i have the expertise to help out in this situation and ultimately he perishes and carnegie reaches out to his his young wife and their son and ensures that they have enough that that uh his son will be educated and that she is enough to support herself um and from there grows this idea of of the hero fund and the idea is well uh we often think of heroes as these exemplars uh, in the battles, in the battles for freedom, you know, the, the wars, both the American Revolution and the Civil War. We think of heroes often as as people who win actual battles. But he says, well, there, are, there there's this whole other class of civilian heroes that is largely unsung. And these people uh, are sometimes incapacitated by the things that they do. Sometimes they die and, and leave behind loved ones that uh, 
you know, thereafter don't have the earning power to really support themselves the way they otherwise would. And so I'm going to find these people or give them a means of, of finding me and make sure that they have enough to live on. And so that's what the Hero Fund was. It started in the U.S., uh, then extended to Britain, Germany, Belgium, France, Italy, all over Europe. I think something like 12 countries have a, have or had a, a Carnegie Hero Fund. We ought to, we ought to apply. <laughs> you know that we are furthering the ideal of heroism mr carnegie uh we, we can certainly use some of that money to do to expand our operations and reach millions more but yeah the hero fund what a great idea you know, seriously what a what a great idea to um you know to to look for look for the real heroes of the people who you know, who stand up to all kinds of obstacles and dangers to, to you know, to advance their own lives or, or human life more broadly and, and, you know, and back your values with, uh, you know, with, with your money. Um, and it's a great idea. And Carnegie uh, helped, helped establish, you know, one of, one, of, one of many things I love about Andrew Carnegie, you know, he's, he's the, uh, the quintessential rags to riches, Horatio Al, real life Horatio Alger, success story and he was always conscious uh, you know of, of that, that that there's a lot of poor kids growing up you know who who are gifted that they're, they're, they're honest they're talented they're you know highly intelligent there's, and you know and an education is the way for them to uh, rise up out of out of poverty and so you know he he wanted to help those kids and he did it in in, in various ways the, the 3000 libraries you know where People could, you know, get, enhance their education, improve their mind, gain knowledge. Always think, especially about the poor kids, you know, who could use that to, you know, to to rise. Uh, there's a library in New York City, John. Uh, is it the the Working Man's Library? I forget the name of it. I should should have, should have Googled it. But there was this organization. Um, uh, for a number of years, f funded by Victor Niederhoff, of the you know Wall Street billionaire, who uh, uh, call, called it the Junto, or the Junto, you know, named mm. after Benjamin Franklin's organization, ah, and it. it was a wild place where you know you you, you give you give part of I, I spoke there twice. You give part of a talk, and then the audience you stop. The audience can rip into you, and they did. They, they <laughs> rip into you. Then you go in the next part, of, and they can rip, and you stop, and they can rip. You know, anything goes. Uh, people yell and scream at you, and and, and and believe me, they they do. I I, I know people who wouldn't even go there anymore. It was so out of control, uh, and just a sounds like a rock concert. Yeah, it was a nasty, it was, it was a nasty place. But you know, Victor Niederhofer was a really was a really good guy, and he supported capitalism, and he was a big Iron Rand. Uh, he is, I think, he's still alive. He's a big Iron Rand guy, and uh, it was in the. It, they held it in this this library that had been established by Andrew Carnegie. I forget if I forget what the name is. It's on, it's in Midtown. It's not it's very close to Grand Central Station. Um, it's, it's like called the, the, the it's called the Working Man's Library or something, something something like that. You know where yeah, it's a free library where you know where workers or or poor guys or anybody you know could come in and, and study and gain knowledge and you know and you know. And, uh, advance their education, improve their mind. Carnegie always very conscious of, of being one to help those poor young guys like he was, you know, in, in his in his youth. 3,000 libraries. Uh, I love what he said about the libraries too. I mean, this is, this is really important. He said, uh, a library gives nothing for nothing. Or in other words, you've got to apply yourself in order for the library to be of value to you. You've got to go on there and use your mind. And so a library gives nothing for nothing. Absolutely right. You know. But it's there for, for, for anybody who wants to enhance their education. And again, I'll repeat a hundred times, Carnegie always conscious of wanting to help poor young guys, talented, ambitious young people with initiative like, like he was. You know? And uh, you know, that, what do they say? There's the an expression today, you pass it forward. Uh, there may have been people in Carnegie's youth who reached out a hand to help him? Uh, I'm sure there was, especially you know, at, at the Pennsylvania Railroad when he was when he was working there. And here he is passing it forward to the next generation of, of ambitious, you know, bright, talented young people uh, like he was. Uh, yeah, there was the Colonel in Pittsburgh who opened his uh, his personal library to the the working boys of Pittsburgh every weekend, and they could come and take a book out for the week. And so he 
uh, he benefited from this in his childhood and said, well, if I'm ever wealthy enough, this is what I'm going to do. And what's funny is that actually the first library that he built was in his hometown of Dumfriesland, Scotland. Uh, and he, I think he learned only after the fact that uh, his dad was one of five or so people in, in the town that had pooled their books to, uh, to create basically a free or, or public library. So there was uh, many precedents for, for Carnegie to, to go into the library starting business, so to speak. And perhaps another one is Benjamin Franklin. I mean, if you, if you look at their lives, it's like it's so extremely uh, interesting how they, they have the sor- same sort of trajectory. And in fact, I live in Franklin, Massachusetts, named after the great Benjamin Franklin, first town in America named after him, and home of the Franklin Public Library, first public library in the country started with books donated by Benjamin Franklin. So Right, they, right. Yeah, well we, well, we discussed Franklin on the Hero Show. We certainly discussed the free library s- the system that, that Franklin uh, created. Again, but yeah, you're right. Poor guy, both of them poor kids who worked their way up by, you know, by a hard work and industriousness and always valued uh, education and hard work. Both of them made themselves into, you know, they were great readers and both of them made themselves into very, very good writers, very successful writers. There's a real parallel, you're right, between the life of Franklin and the life of, of Carnegie. Um, we, we, we need to mention, I'm sorry, John, did, were you finished with what you were saying about no, 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 go the, ahead. the great Ben Franklin? Uh, one of the things I admire, uh, many things I admire about uh, Andrew Carnegie is he was a large beneficiary of Tuskegee Institute in uh, in Alabama. I, you know, recognizing that uh, Booker T. Washington was doing a great job, you know, at Tuskegee Institute, you know, educating young young black minds there. Of course, George Washington Carver, who we discussed on the Hero Show, was uh, doing great work in agricultural research at Tuskegee. And in the context, this is the Jim Crow South. You know where blacks are brutally oppressed and persecuted by, by uh, white racists. Ra- white racism re- and white supremacy really was a thing back then, a hundred years ago. Uh, <laughs> the leftists screaming about it today are a hundred years behind the times, but it really was uh, a thing back then. Carnegie recognizing that, and put a lot of money into Tuskegee Institute to help uh, book. Well, Booker T. Washington was. Um, Died, I think, in 1915. But you know, whether Washington was still alive or to to the people who were running Tuskegee after after Washington's death, Carnegie was a huge benefactor at Tuskegee. So you know, you give him a lot of credit uh, for recognizing you know the that 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 was an enormous value educating you know the the black the black kids and the young you know, young black minds that the that the segregationists in the South could care less whether these young in fact they don't want. They don't want black kids to, you know, to get an education. Um, Tuskegee, the Carnegie Institute of Technology, which uh, later uh, merges with uh, this, this, the Mellon, what was it, the Mellon, I, I forget, Andrew Mellon established it, I, I believe, uh, to become Carnegie Mellon University, which is an outstanding you know, university. Uh, today. I've lectured there uh, a number of times for, for the Ayn Rand Institute. You got really, really good students at, at Carnegie Mellon. You're getting an excellent education, especially, you know, in high tech. Uh, they're known for, you know, their high tech fields, you know, tech school, like, like at, uh, you know, along the lines of Caltech and MIT. You know, that's, that's how good uh, Carnegie Mellon is. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Carnegie did a lot of good. His, his you see his acumen here. If overwhelmingly, Carnegie donated money to worthy causes. He didn't. He didn't. You know. He didn't squander his. Well, how much? How much of it? He put like something. Something. I forget how. Ninety percent of his fortune, which was like five billion dollars. Ninety percent of his fortune, he he'd given away. A lot of it, maybe most of it, was given to very worthy causes. To to. Uh, Prior to Ayn Rand, it's like he, he recognized at some level that this, the mind, is, is the key fact in human life. And libraries, universities, you know, this is, this is where, where, where Carnegie put a, a great amount of, of money. And he, and he certainly did a lot of good. And I think, I think we should say, 
And now I'm, I'm speculating here, John, but I, I think it's true, and I certainly hope it's true, that Carnegie did not do this out of a Kantian sense of duty, regardless of what he said in the essay, The Gospel of Will. It strikes me more as an, as an Aristotelian objective, his sense of, of personal value, that this meant something to him, that this, that this was enormously rewarding to him, that he experienced this joyously. I think that's true, and I certainly hope. I certainly hope it was. Well, I share your hope. Um, he, he seems to have indicated that, and you know, in his autobiography, he relays several letters from people who, um, who indicated how much his various charitable enterprises were, were benefiting people. And so he seemed very proud of, of that work. And, um, and, and so at the very least, we can say he did it without tremendous sacrifice to himself. He still lived very well. He bought a castle in Scotland, went there every summer and, uh, you know, enjoyed his life. Um, yeah, it's true. I, I mean, you know, I can relate to that. If I if I was a billionaire, I mean, what am I going to do with the money? I yeah, I, I'm I'm happy. I'm just a kid from Brooklyn, John. I'm happy driving a Honda. I don't you know I don't, I don't need to drive a you know a Mercedes or a Ferrari or a Rolls. <laughs> I'm I'm happy renting. I have a nice apartment with everything I need. I, would, I, I you know I don't need a big mansion and everything. I can I can relate to that. I have enough money to live. Uh, comfortably in the lifestyle that I prefer, be able to, you know, put my daughter through, you know, college and, you know, and uh, <laughs> what am I going to do with the money? I mean, I, I, in, actually what I would do, like I said, is is I would, I would invest it in the most productive companies. One, you know, I'd make money on the dividends and two, those productive companies use the money to do R&D, you know, to make advances, to hire more workers, to, to, to produce more output, uh, bring the prices down. And, you know, and, and it's a win-win. Everybody benefits. And Carnegie did an immense amount of that at Carnegie Steel. And I like to think he seeded more with his educational activities. God knows how many people uh, had their educations enhanced by Carnegie's libraries and, and, and donations to universities and stuff and went on to, you know, to reach great achievements in their own lives and achievements that benefited them first, foremost, and always, but also uh, we're all benefited by, by human, human achievements in any field. So I, yeah, one of the achievements that he mentions he's pretty proud of in his autobiography is um, the Carnegie Institute. So there was a, another Institute in Washington, DC and there they they had uh, Carnegie Institute and they had scientists working. They they had a ship that actually sailed around and helped to correct some of the bad um, so some of the bad maps that had been made of the oceans. And uh, he was he was very happy that this benefited a lot of different people. There was um, there was a sailor who uh, he grounded his ship apparently off the Azores. And Carnegie said, well, you, you can't really fault him because the, the maps were really bad. And this is something that we're helping to correct. So uh, and, and he also funded um, an observatory for uh, astronomy. Mount Wilson. So, right? Was it Mount Wilson Observatory? I think. Mm -hmm. I think. Yep. Mount Wilson Observatory. So, uh, yeah, directly he, he was trying to fund scientific advance. But his key thing was, well, you know, if you give wealth to to the wrong people in the wrong situations, they're going to do themselves more harm than good. And so and and in fact, he thought that most charity ever given had done way more harm than good. So you've got to find the levers, you've got to find the ways to help those who want to help themselves pull the, pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Right. And, and you know, that, you know, libraries give nothing for nothing. Uh, institution like institutions of higher learning like Tuskegee and Carnegie Mellon. These are places where you, you've got to apply yourself if you're going to benefit from them. And that's what he was always looking for in, in his philanthropy. And there's real wisdom there. I mean, the modern American welfare state shows how, you know, g giving money away to people who don't have to work to do anything for it is, is does vastly more harm than good. Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right. The scholarships, when you find poor kids who are bright and motivated and you could provide scholarships to, you know, to, to colleges and everything. These are the kids who are going to take advantage of it. These are the kids who are, who are going to work hard and apply themselves. Like, like you said, it's, there's a lot of wisdom um, in this. And I want to, you know, at, at least one more 
of, of his uh, ventures that, that I think we, we should mention, even though it, it was futile in his lifetime. But it shows a very benign personality here. Carnegie's commitment to, to world peace. Uh, you know, early in the 20th century, you could see the, the, the forces that lead to World War I, the bloodbath of World War I is just in turmoil in, on the European continent. And, you know, Europe is heading towards a bloodbath. And a lot of people could see that coming, including Carnegie. And, and, he, and he put a lot of time and effort into trying to avert war. I mean, Carnegie was enormously personable. He was a great rock and tour. He was friend of presidents and premiers and kings and princes. And he tried, you know, to, to use his influence to, you know, to, to bring peace in Europe. And he was friends with... Um, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm in Germany, and you know, and and, and he he was you know the, put money into what was the Peace Palace in the is it is it in the Hague I think somewhere in the Netherlands and negotiating and you know his retirement with European heads of state and, and Carnegie said forthrightly you know that you know even though he was friends with the Kaiser he, he said the real the real impediment to peace in Europe is not the British it's the Germans <laughs> you, you know I don't, I don't want to sound like a racist here but because your know, German culture has been enormously uh, creative and productive in, in every field but there has been a certain militaristic you know tendency in uh, in in German history and and um and Carnegie was was right about that. He he put a lot of effort into trying to avert European war, but it was it was doomed to, to failure. But it it shows you know a very benign side of Carnegie's personality and the the, the uh, his character, the desire to avert the blood the, the bloodbath that was coming. He said, "If you want to be happy, set a goal that commands your thoughts, liberates your energy, and inspires your hopes." And I really think that's the key to it all is find productive purpose in your life and go, go out and achieve it. Make that your one thing. Put all your eggs in that one basket. Yep. I mean, there's, there's a lot of wisdom there. As, as I want to close here with uh, Napoleon Hill in uh, Think and Grow Rich, which was a, a great self-help book. And Napoleon Hill says that Andrew Carnegie, you know, bankrolled him to go out and interview all of the successful guys and find the characteristics that made them successful and write up the book so that, again, bright young kids, especially if they're poor, can, can read it, gain the wisdom and, uh, you know, and learn from that and, you know, and, and, and advance. Uh, so, uh, and, and Hill's book is very good. Uh, you know, it's an excellent book. Yeah, on this. Now, the bad news is a little research indicates that Hill wasn't the most honest guy in the world, and there's there's no corroborating evidence that Hill ever met with Carnegie or knew Carnegie or had anything to do with Carnegie. It may have been, this may have been a you know a, a myth that that Napoleon Hill himself hatched, uh, but he could get away with it because it it, it fits what it fits what Carnegie was all about. You know, <laughs> you know it fits the, it fits the spirit of Carnegie. You know, to to take these steps that could be enormously beneficial to poor talented, ambitious young people who, who, who have great ambitions to, to rise uh, in life. So Hill may have been lying about that, but his book, I think, was helpful in, this, in the spirit of, of Andrew Carnegie. So any, uh, any, other, any other tributes we can pay to this great man, or do you, or do you think that's, that's a wrap? Well, I definitely invite people who are interested to go check out his autobiography. You learn a, a lot about him from his own, uh, you know, you get something from Hill. Now I'm not sure what, some sort of <laughs> vague account of, of what success is. But if you want it in, uh, in, in Carnegie's own words, excellent writer, brilliant, funny storyteller. So go pick up the autobiography. You'll learn a lot about his life and a lot about uh, industry in general. And uh, one topic that comes up there is uh, the science and the chemistry that went into turning Carnegie Steel into the, the greatest steel empire in the U.S. in the world. And um, that's really instructive. So, so definitely check that out.
Yeah, Con Carnegie's autobiography is is very very helpful. I, I would recommend it, just like we discussed Benjamin Franklin's autobiography. And we would be remiss if we didn't say, get yourself some tickets to Carnegie Hall. You know, <laughs> <laughs> which Carnegie uh, funded, and I think he owned it. And mm -hmm. you know, and Carnegie Hall has great acoustics, and it's been a, a center for you know for superb concerts for over a hundred years now. And there was that great joke when I was a kid, you know, uh, some 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 kid on uh, on the streets of New York accosts some some older guy, and he says, "Sir, how do I get to Carnegie Hall?" And the guy says, "Practice, son, practice." <laughs> 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 you know? Words of wisdom. Yeah, I, I mentioned a New York City landmark for decades was the Carnegie Deli on Seventh Avenue, right? You know, <laughs> just a few blocks south of Carnegie. Hall, my favorite deli with had sandwiches like this big. Unfortunately, they closed. They closed a few years ago, but for decades that was, uh, you know, a New York City landmark. You see, you see tourists from Oklahoma with their cameras taking pictures of the sandwich before they, before uh. they, before they dug in. <laughs> that I, right. I, I don't think the Carnegie Deli was founded by Andrew Carnegie. But You're making it, me hungry. Yeah, Let's wrap yeah, well, these things it's, up it's so I can go make a sandwich. Yeah, it's lunchtime. <laughs> it, it was right down Seventh Avenue from Carnegie Hall. I guess that's where it got the got the name from. But anyhow, Carnegie Hall, <laughs> one one of, again one of Carnegie's great contributions to. Mm. Uh, New York City and to you know cultural life generally. So, I I think we salute you, Mr. Carnegie and John. I want to wish you have a more and everybody out there in Hero Land have a more heroic day, lead a more heroic life, everybody. And we will be back on the Hero Show next week with the immortal Michael Jordan. Is that <laughs> have a great day, everybody. Mm -hmm.